Okay, well, good afternoon. Um, welcome to this event held jointly between the European Policy Centre and the Coordinated Action on Social Services, which is a task force bringing together Social Services Europe, Caritas Europa, the European Platform for National Non-Profit Umbrella Organisations, the European Association of Service Providers for Persons with Disabilities, Eurodiaconia, the European Ageing Network, the European Network of Social Integration Enterprises, European Platform for Rehabilitation, European Social Network, the European Federation of National Organisations Working with the Homeless, the European Federation of Public Services Unions, and the Federation for European uh, Social Employers and Solidar. So these organisations together represent a huge number of service users, employers, employees, and of course volunteers, and work together to strengthen the profile and position of social services in Europe. We are extremely pleased to be cooperating with them today in order to get a sense of the impact of the last year and how they view the current and upcoming activities at EU level and what impact they expect to see. Uh, and in particular, of course, in relation to the Porto Summit in a week's time and the European Pillar of Social Rights Action Plan. I'm Laura Rayner, I'm Policy Analyst for the European Policy Centre as part of the Social Europe and Wellbeing Programme, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. So just to give you a, a sense of the shape of the event, we'll begin with some opening remarks from uh, President Emeritus of the European Council and President of the European Policy Centre, Herman van Rompuy. This will be followed by a short presentation from Andriana Sukova, who is Deputy Director General for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion, the European Commission. And she'll give a look at the work the Commission has been doing uh, and her expectations for the summit and, and the action plan. So following this, uh, Heather Roy, who's Secretary General of Eurodiaconia, and Jakob Embacher, who's Policy Officer in charge of social services at EPSU, will respond to what they've heard. Um, unfortunately, just to um, make clear that Jan Willem Gaudrian, who is, uh, was scheduled to speak today, is unfortunately unwell. So y Jakob has very kindly uh, offered to step in and, and replace him. Um, so after this, we'll then open the floor to questions, uh, particularly at this point on the Porto Summit and the place of the pillar in the recovery. Um, however, I should say, please feel free to write your questions in the Q&A box as they occur to you during the course of the meeting, and I'll try to bring them into the discussion as and when is appropriate. Um, if you are feeling brave enough to ask your question verbally, then by all means, just raise your, your hand. You can do so if you, you go to the participants button uh, on the bottom of the screen. Uh, I'll then be able to give you the floor for you to ask your question verbally. Um, so for the second part of the meeting, we'll be joined by Manuelita Sciliano, who's Deputy Director of Caritas Crotone, that's part of Caritas Italiana, who will give us a short presentation of the reality on the ground, in particular in the context of the pandemic, and the work that social service providers do to make the rights and principles of the pillar of social rights a reality. So then Heather and Jacob will, will join me once again to respond to the presentation and explore how to make the full implementation of the pillar of reality in Europe. And again, at this point, your questions are very welcome. And so finally, I'll hand the floor to Luke Zeldalu, President of Social Services Europe and Secretary General of the EASPD. Uh, he'll be able to round up our discussion, uh, bring in his observations, his thoughts, any recommendations he might have uh, for, for the future. So with that, let's properly begin. Uh, as mentioned, we'll start with some opening remarks from President Emeritus of the European Council, Herman van Rompuy. Ladies and gentlemen, COVID time is hard for everyone, but for some it is harder than others. We are in the same storm, but not in the same boat. Now, fighting inequalities is again high on the political agenda because these have been increasing, these inequalities, in recent decades. COVID-19 brings new inequalities on top of the existing ones. Not everyone can protect themselves from the pandemic in the same way. Remember the lack of mouth masks at the beginning of the first lockdown. Elderly people in nursing homes were much more exposed than others, especially those living in large units. People who cannot telework are more vulnerable 
than those who can work from home. Families with a garden experience a more bearable period than those who have to work remotely with children in a flat. And the list is long. I am not even talking about those who lost their jobs or lost their lives. A lot of creativity, innovation, and resilience, solidarity has been shown by many to make the best of it. All attention has rightly been and continues to be focused on those most physically affected by COVID and most likely to even die. There are almost half a million deathly casualties in Europe. But that does not alter the fact that fate also struck elsewhere, mentally and in other ways. The European Union as an institution has almost no competence in the social sphere unless it is supplementary and coordinating. The European Parliament, the Council and the Commission proclaimed the European Pillar of Social Rights in 2017. It consists of 20 principles that have guided us ever since towards a strong social Europe. Its implementation depends very much on the cooperation of the member states. And nevertheless, it was an important step. And of course, implementation is key. Although the union is not really competent on health, it reacted relatively quickly by setting up a fund mechanism to support the social services sector. But these funds have still not reached the sector. Often, the member state level turns out to be the bottleneck. In general, solidarity is a crucial value for the Union. The Corona crisis showed this once more. The European Recovery Fund is a real breakthrough because it involves a huge amount of money, 750 billion euros, 390 of which are donations, non-refundable gifts. So it's a breakthrough. And because also the target group is those countries and regions most affected by the pandemic. Negotiating this was difficult precisely because it involved solidarity. Another example is the European procurement for vaccines. The intention here is that every member state, large and small, should have equal access to vaccines. If all member states come out of the crisis together, they strengthen each other and the economic impulse is all the stronger. Ladies and gentlemen, this crisis has also shown how important health is, both physical and mental. Today, social services, I mean, home care, facilities for the disabled, care for children, poverty reduction, and, and many others. So today, social services already represent 5% of the working population, or 11 million people. And together with the pure health sector, hospitals, these services employ over 11% of workforce in the European Union. The increase here over the last 10 years has been 24%. The aging of the population will further reinforce this trend. The contribution of millions of volunteers across Europe can also not be ignored, especially from the perspective of social cohesion. And indeed, also professionals should be better recognized and valued for their contribution to society. These citizens dedicate their careers to helping others live a better life. But in the past decade, healthcare has sometimes been blindly economized on with the consequences that entails today. One of the most important benchmarks for the corona policy was and is the capacity of hospitals and especially intensive care units. Today, it is feared that this scenario of austerity will be repeated once the pandemic is over and efforts must be made to reduce the budget deficits. However, it is not about less money, but more money. 
The economic and social impact of this crisis is also expected to lead to a higher demand for social services than prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. And therefore, in its new recovery fund, the EU should not only consider the digital and ecological transformation, but also the social and human capital. I repeat, the pandemic has shown the importance of collective goods for all, but especially for the most vulnerable. There is, of course, not just one single social services ecosystem in Europe. However, all require further strengthening and improvement. The European Union needs to play a stronger role in the development of social services ecosystems, for instance, in funding, policy guidance, monitoring of progress, support to social dialogue and, legis and legislation where appropriate. Such EU action is crucial if it is to strengthen social convergence, cohesion, and resilience across Europe and to ensure the European pillar of social rights becomes a reality irrespective of where one lives. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope, I sincerely hope that the Conference on the Future of Europe which starts on May the 9th, will pay sufficient attention to the competences that be in the field of health. The aim of the policy remains to give people a good life. I would add a better life. That must continue to be our goal, doing better and better. Let us already draw the conclusions from this unique and tragic experience of the last year. I wish you a fruitful dialogue this afternoon on how to make the EU stronger by making it more social. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for, uh, for that presentation from, from Herman van Rompuy. Uh, as always uh, with him, there's plenty in there to, to think about. And indeed, uh, as, he, as he put it, I hope that today we can uh, draw some conclusions from the experiences of the, the last year. Um, so I'll, I'll now pass the floor to Andriana Sokova, as I said, Deputy Director General for DG Employment, to give us some thoughts on the Porto Summit and, and the action plan. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. And first of all, I want to thank you for the invitation, because uh, I believe that such discussions are very important also to hear a lot of opinions, a lot of ideas from uh, the non-governmental sector in Europe, and also uh, get a reassurance that we are going on the right way and the right direction. Uh, the speech of uh, Mr. Van Rompuy was very uh, clear and, uh, how to say, inspirational, but also uh, helping me start my introduction, because he referred to the pillar of social rights and uh, its importance and uh, the importance of the pillar, which uh, some considered in 2017 as something that will fade away, like many high level political documents, in fact, didn't happen. And the pillar of social rights remained a good framework for efforts on any fronts from many organizations, institutions, public and national authorities uh, in the direction of an, ensuring that our actions contribute to achieving an upward social convergence in Europe. And that's the whole uh, objective of the pillar. But uh, the pillar, and Mr. Van Rompuy also mentioned, is not uh, uh, the responsibility and uh, the only uh, responsibility for the commission because we have limited competences in the social area and we need a lot of involvement and a lot of commitment and delivery from the national authorities. So um, the president uh, of the European Commission, uh, Ms. von der Leyen, underlined that uh, in her introduction in uh, two years almost now, uh, as the president of the European Commission, that she will come up with an action plan for the pillar and exactly to identify uh, those elements where the European Commission can be the inspirational force, but also where the member states have to take up and act upon uh, of the principles and rights identified in the pillar. So uh, the European Pillar Social Rights Action Plan was adopted on the 4th of March and um, 
this uh, was also well argumented and justified uh, by the need considered by all Europeans, because the, uh, we had a, a Eurobarometer survey which demonstrates that nine out of 10 Europeans are considering social issues that imp are important to them personally. So we have to act. We have to be sure that uh, within the limited powers and uh, the limited possibilities for action, the commission should be pushing member states towards uh, pre preparing and also implementing uh, all the necessary legislation nationally, making sure that uh, the pillar is delivering for every single European citizen. Second, uh, the action plan is a call to join forces on uh, to strengthen social Europe. And uh, we must maintain our sense of solidarity. And as Mr. Van Rompuy said, we are now at a test of solidarity at European Union from many angles and from many fronts. So we have to come strong and fight the crisis and develop policies that will be recovering our economy. So uh, we also worked for the preparation of the action plan because the pillar should stand at the center of our approach to the transformation of our economy and society. The pandemic also underlined uh, by Mr. Van Ropo is a very damaging and very serious um, test for us uh, shows that it is very important to have resilient social protection systems and also well-developed social services. With the next uh, long-term budget, and uh, it's indeed an impressive amount of 750 billion euro, uh, we have put the largest investment package ever throughout the European, through the European budget. And we need to drive investments and reforms in the national recovery and resilience plans exactly when it comes to the social area to uh, work within the action plan of the pillar and making sure that these uh, investments and reforms are with a very strong mind and inclination towards upward social and economic convergence. The social services are a key part of ensuring that social resilience is there and uh, the main logic of the action plan is built on three key targets. First, uh, we want to make sure that efforts guided by the European level, but also implemented at national and local levels, bring at least 78% of the population, which is in the working age between 20 and 64, in employment by 2030. We want also to ensure that the capacities, the knowledge, the competencies of the workforce are matching the needs of the labor market. And for that, we've put a target of 60% of all adults to participate in a training at least once every year. And then uh, we consider that uh, the Europe 2020 strategy, which put a 20 million people to be taken out of poverty, is an important target, which unfortunately could not be achieved due to some additional external factors, but we think that uh, the number of people at risk of poverty or social exclusion by 2030 should be reduced by at least 15 million. And uh, the action plan invites uh, now in Porto, the Euro informal European Council to endorse these targets. And that's why Porto is very important for us. It's very soon, it's only next week. So uh, we are really in very hectic preparations currently in uh, uh, all the different, uh, uh, discussions and seminars that will take place. It's going to be a huge event, but we also uh, think that uh, by confirming these targets, this European Council will also be uh, another, an additional uh, leverage for member states to identify their national targets, starting from their national situations, but also giving them a good ambition. And um, we also will ask member states to set up their internal coordination mechanisms. Of course, uh, the involvement of civil society and non-governmental sector is a key for us and it has always been a key for us in the last years and it continues like this. We believe that uh, the broader base of involvement ensures a broader ownership and the broader support. So uh, we are not in any way stepping aside from uh, the demands towards member states to make sure that they 
have a broad involvement and listen to opinions of uh, stakeholders and civil society. Uh, what is the relevance of the action plan for social services specifically? I think that uh, we have to take care of uh, a group of people that are the focus of um, many of these organizations that are now connected. Uh, in order to achieve these three big targets, we need to collectively reach out to women, to persons with disabilities, to people with migrant background, those who have been inactive or unemployed for a long time, for persons with caring responsibilities or those who experience or at risk of social exclusion. And for that, we need effective social services. Some examples of recent, recent and planned EU level initiatives, which are relevant for uh, the work and also uh, for the success of the implementation of the action plan include first the commission recommendation on effective active support to employment following the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's uh, in brief called EASE uh, recommendation, which outlines a strategic approach to gradually transition from job preservation to job creation, to relocation of labor, but preparing this labor that's moving from one employment to another with the right skills and competencies. And uh, it stresses the need for very strong cooperation between employment services and social services to reach people in vulnerable situations, especially. This also uh, resonates with the reinforced youth guarantee, which we adopted last year on the 1st of July, <clears throat> which now expands the target group, the, uh, the age of the target group of young people from 15 to 29, and also has a special emphasis on uh, the need to strengthen partnerships with social services and develop integrated services modules. Many social service providers are also social economy enterprises. And uh, the social economy action plan will be presented by the commission by the end of this year. We're working now on that. Uh, we want to focus on facilitating the work of social enterprises and also uh, especially those that are active in the field of social services and inclusive employment. We have a new strategy for the rights of persons with disabilities for 21, 2030, which covers also service supporting uh, service uh, providers supporting independent living. As part of the strategy, the commission has committed to present by 2024, a specific framework for social services of excellence for persons with disabilities, to improve service delivery for persons with disabilities, and also to enhance the attractiveness of jobs in this area. And Mr. Van Rompuy mentioned the huge increase in employment in the social services area by 24% which is really remarkable. I don't think uh, any other sector, maybe IT sector is a competitor in such a high uh, demand of people, but uh, this is really showing uh, the need for first making this job attractive, but also providing the skills that are needed for the job and uh, making sure that uh, we have uh, a well-established systems that can help those that need individual support, but also their families which need this support so that they can work and uh, have their careers. We are now reflecting on an EU initiative on long-term care. And uh, this is something which is uh, under consideration at a very early stage, but it will come uh, in 2022 only. So uh, this is on the radar of uh, our discussions. We had our proposal for a directive on adequate minimum wages, which we introduced last year. and. Uh, with this, we want to reduce wage inequalities and also poverty for the most vulnerable workers, the low skilled, including uh, the critical workers in the social services and other uh, sectors. Uh, the new data from the EU Structure of Earnings Survey shows that on average, EU member states pay their social services workers 21% less than the average national hourly earnings in 2018. So despite the numerous people involved in the uh, social service uh, care sector, their salaries are not uh, adequate and they're really uh, something that needs to be addressed and making sure that they have a decent income uh, for the very uh, noble and humane job they do. Uh, in March, end of March, we also adopted a council recommendation establishing a European child guarantee 
and it aims at supporting children in, in need to access key services. And uh, it's very unfortunate that in Europe in 2019, 22.2% of children were living in households at risk of poverty or social exclusion. And this is about 18 million children. We cannot leave this huge potential future, the future of Europe uh, without uh, any attention and uh, any action directed uh, to them. So the child guarantee will be one of the uh, key focuses of the investments uh, under the funding of uh, the European budget. For 2022, we also have announced a council recommendation on minimum income, minimum income where uh, we want to reinforce the active inclusion approach, which combines adequate income adequate income with access to the labor market and also provision of enabling services, including social services. Uh, in close cooperation with the Portuguese presidency and Fianza, one of the uh, colleagues joining today, we will launch a European platform on combating homelessness because it's a shame for Europe to have homeless people and uh, we are very well aware that ending homelessness requires the cooperation of all stakeholders, including national and local authorities, cities, housing organizations, and social services as well. Uh, the European Pillar of Social Rights is also uh, one of the uh, key policy instruments which we want to be supported by the European budget. And uh, we have almost 98 billion within the European Social Fund Plus for the 21 27 uh, period to um, directly support the implementation of the Pill of Social Rights, making sure that uh, investments through the ESF Plus are directly contributing to the achievement or to making the principles and rights a reality for the European citizens. We'll be working on all three uh, parts of the Pill of Social Rights, at equal opportunities and access to the labor market, fair working conditions and social protection and inclusion. And this is very well uh, reflected in the specific objectives, which are the core of the investments to be uh, planned by the member states for the next programming period. Another very important uh, direction of DSF Plus is uh, to make sure that people get possibilities for training to getting the right skills with, uh, for the jobs that are on the labor market and uh, also giving special attention to the access to the labor market for people with, um, which are furthest away from the labor market, such as young people not in employment, education or training, which are very sometimes very difficult to reach and mobilize and stimulate, but also low skilled and also people who are long-term unemployed or inactive. And the COVID limitations of communication of uh, contacting people has put an additional uh, challenge to this uh, effort. Uh, we also have um, within the European budget, uh, a special part of the European Regional Development Fund, which should be programmed for policy objective four, which is exactly called implement, uh, social, more social and inclusive Europe, implementing the European pillar of social rights to ensure that the necessary infrastructure is there uh, for achieving the objectives of the uh, policy. Uh, the European Regional Development Fund should provide uh, support for get, getting the social infrastructure, the social housing, daycare centers, uh, equipment supporting independent living, transport to improve access uh, to mainstream services, uh, equipment targeting the social services workforce, attracting and training care workforce and so on. And uh, one of the biggest new instruments, which is the Recovery and Resilience Facility, which is currently under um, final stages of planning by the member states, uh, should also contribute to uh, the labor market development, to social policy, health and educational systems. And also the commitment of the commission is to monitor the sound implementation of the Recovery and Resilience plans by the member states, and also how these uh, substantial budgets under RRP are uh, complementing the activities of DSF Plus and uh, the ERDF. Uh, our thoughts about how to best support social services are in the direction of um, 
first recognizing the social services and uh, frontline health and social workers having a major role in mitigating the effect of the crisis and supporting the people that are most vulnerable in the current situation. We have been uh, supporting social services through the crisis uh, with uh, almost already a year ago, uh, and we will continue to do so. We are setting uh, a more permanent structure of uh, a social services help desk, which should facilitate uh, the access to uh, the funds and also the use of the funds by uh, social services, be it when they address the impact of the COVID uh, pandemic or uh, when they are involved in implementation of uh, the EU social policy framework, in particular, the elements of the pillar of social rights and uh, the uh, follow-up uh, policy initiatives. Just to conclude, let me stress that this action plan uh, is our main contribution to the social summit of Porto. And uh, I, I, I underline again, we, we expect that the leaders will be taking a very wise political decision to support the headline targets and also mobilize national politicians and uh, national governments and institutions to support the ambitions through national action. Uh, we, we think this, will, this is gonna be a very strong political signal for the social focus of the European action and also of um, how uh, a framework can help Europe change its approach, its content, its uh, future, and also uh, how the European uh, Union will be uh, changing social Europe, which is uh, really a model which doesn't exist anywhere else and which is uh, so important to be kept, developed and also uh, protected for the future. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm ready to listen to all the interventions and also uh, contribute in the next one hour and a half. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, indeed a very thorough uh, look at what the Commission have been doing and planning to do. Um, maybe I'll go first to Heather for, for your reactions to that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. And um, thank you on behalf of the Coordinated Action Group on Social Services for the partnership with the EPC today. It's a real opportunity to speak perhaps in a broader context about the challenges that have faced the social services sector over the past um, year and indeed have the dialogue with the Commission and with other stakeholders on how we can potentially move forward. And it's always interesting to hear from uh, President Emeritus uh, uh, Van Rompuy and indeed from Adriana Sukoba because they have very well outlined the situation that we, that we have that we are stuck in the uh, bizarre somewhat situation of tensions between the market and the constrictions that are placed uh, on the EU through the um, provisions of the treaty when it comes to subsidiarity on, on social policy. And one of the things that struck me the most in this past year is that from our perspective in the Coordinated Action Group, um, I mean, we, we did not exist 15 months ago. This coordinated action group on social services came together because of what we saw was happening through uh, for profit making services, not for profit making services, employment in the services, for the users of the services. And we created this much broader um, coalition of organizations who had this common interest in ensuring that social services were recognised for their essential nature in the uh, COVID pandemic, but also beyond that. And it's one of the ironies that the, one of the most underfunded, understaffed and under-recognised sectors of our public welfare systems has become one of the most essential at a time of crisis. And I think it should be a wake-up call for all of us and, and, and I, I don't direct this to the Commission particularly, but for all of us to realise that we can no longer continue to see social services as being on the sidelines of what we understand public investment to be and what is for the common good of our societies, as I think um, 
Mr. Van Rompuy was referring to. If we did not have social services in the past year, we would have seen a much greater fracturing of our societies, much greater difficulties, not only with long-term care, and there's always a danger that when we talk about social services, we're always thinking about long-term care services, but it's much wider than that. It's, it's um, preventing domestic violence. It's supporting people with mental health difficulties. It's ensuring that people have secure accommodation. Um, it's ensuring that early childhood care and education is available. There's many, many different things that we, we refer to as social services. But many of those ser services were told to shut down when the crisis started. And yet they were essential for people's well-being in the crisis. And so they had to be incredibly agile and refuse to be fragile, but be agile and find new ways of delivering those services quickly, often at their own cost and often with no structural or systemic support till quite far into the uh, crisis period. And then, of course, we had the situation of, of long term and residential care services that were, were treating both social and, and health care needs, who were left often, and we know this already, without the right equipment, without any support to replace staff who were no longer able to work due to the, either their own health condition, family situation, or indeed illness from COVID, were faced with an ever changing raft of government and different member states regulations and rules as to how they were to deal with COVID, how to deal with families, no proper coordination, communication or sequencing of regulations and were often just expected to do what was needed without any structural support. And that has left a legacy that needs to be recognised as we move forward with the idea of upward social convergence in Europe. Upward social convergence is, is necessary alongside economic upward convergence. We can't have one without the other. But we cannot have upward social convergence if we refuse to recognize the most essential sectors that provide social cohesion and ensure social cohesion, which is part of the treaties. And that's where social services come in. So, so that's my, my first, my first um, reflection. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Jakob, uh, just straight to, to you. Uh, thank you, Laura. Um, good morning to all. My name is uh, Jakob Embacher. I'm here today to present the EPSU, which is the European Federation of Public Service Unions. EPSA represents 8 million workers in public, non-profit and private organizations that provide public services. And social services is uh, one of the key sectors for us. And as was already mentioned in the beginning, I'm standing in today for our general secretary, who unfortunately took uh, quite sick suddenly today at noon. Um, I think much already has been said by Heather that we completely support on the importance of social services um, and at times the lack of support to authorities, much also by Adriana and um, Adriana Sukova and Hermann von Rompuy. Uh, from my side, I just want to uh, highlight the perspective of the workers in social services over the past year. And to this end, I am um, particularly honored to take the floor today, just one day after Workers' Memorials Day, which we celebrate on April 28th. We we'll remember the workers that have uh, died in the line of work. And two days before the 1st of May, which is, of course, Labor Day and is uh, probably the most important day of the year for, for trade unions. Um, as Mr. Van Rompuy and Ms. Sukova rightly pointed out, social service workers were essential during the pandemic. They often showed heroic efforts in protecting the elderly, people with disability, young children, and many more. But in many cases, they were not able to protect themselves. Many care workers had to work long hours due to a lack of staffing. They risked infection, not just of themselves, but also of their family. They were suffering under unbearable mental pressure due to fear of infection. They faced poor working conditions, precarious working conditions, insufficient access to personal safety, and in many countries also limited access to sick pay, to sick leave. 
together with the colleagues at the Federation of uh, Euro European Federation of Social Employers, we at EPSU have repeatedly urged the Commission to do more to protect those workers, for instance, by ensuring access to protective equipment and encouraging member states to, um, to improve access to sick leave, especially in these trying times. And in general, I would say there was a lot of uh, recognition for social service workers during the pandemic in the form of applauses and symbolic gestures. Suddenly everyone was, um, was highlighting the importance of social service workers. But it is clear, of course, that these symbolic gestures are not enough and that we need to see better working conditions and uh, jobs with strong collective agreements. And I think Misukova was quite right when she pointed out that the discrepancy between the importance of the work done and uh, the concrete working conditions in the sector, where we actually in most countries see um, wages quite below the average. Uh, unfortunately, in reality, during COVID pandemic, we have seen that once it comes down to collective bargaining rounds, when it, once it comes down to actually bargaining for uh, working conditions and wages, the too often suddenly the praise for social service workers uh, got quite silent and it did not translate into concrete outcomes for workers. However, those, um, the right to collective bargaining must be ensured in, able to allow workers, in order to allow workers to protect themselves to protect also, and to protect, of course, the people also they care for. Especially in the long term, we know that there is a lack of care workers in Europe. And we know that in our aging society, this lack is only bound to get worse. Uh, in order to make this profession more attractive, in order to combat this lack of social service workers, we need to make the, create better jobs, better well-paying jobs, and we need to make the profession more attractive for that. And to this end, we need the stronger collective bargaining systems. We need to move away from, as Mr. Rompuy said quite rightly, blind economization of health and social care services and understaffing and towards well-funded public services of good quality. And we believe that the European pillar of social rights can play a key role in promoting such a new model of a right to care of accessible quality care services. We have particularly high expectations for the initiative on long-term care in 2022 that was also mentioned by Mrs. Sukova. Um, we believe it's important to, to use this opportunity to set the framework for policy reforms for sustainable long-term care as mentioned in the action plan. Within this initiative, uh, we would hope to see a prioritization of better funding and higher staffing levels for the social services sector. And uh, with this brief recap, I would close my short reaction and I'm looking forward to questions. Thank you, Jakob. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll open the floor to questions now. Please uh, either raise your hand or, or write them in the Q&A box. That's fine. Um, just as a prerogative uh, for the chair, I'll, I'll maybe start, though we've touched on so many different topics, it's a little hard to, to know exactly where to start. Um, but I suppose it would be remiss of me not to mention the, the non-paper that was um, that appeared in the last week or so uh, related to the Porto Summit. Um, and, you know, I, I have questions myself. I mean, are we, well, as, as Herman van Rompuy put it, the member states are often the bottleneck. Um, and indeed, as uh, Mr. Kova mentioned, you know, we're, we're at a, a point that maybe we're testing the solidarity that, that we're seeing. Um, do you think that we've maybe reached the the limits of some member states' willingness to sort of pull comp uh, competences on, on these topics, even after, you know, or even in fact, in the midst still of this pandemic, uh, are we really seeing the, the walls come down and, you know, the, the, the armor come on? Um, I, I wonder maybe, um, uh, Andriana, if you want to, to come in. Well, uh, first, I want to thank Heather and uh, Jakob for putting very concrete uh, challenges, identifying problems which are really uh, very important for everyone to consider. I'll start with the long-term care initiative. Uh, in fact, we have started discussion and it's becoming so wide that we now have to make a choice <laughs> because long-term care initiative will be, uh, should be considered from so many angles that, uh, if we want to succeed, we should identify the core and start from there. Because if we start with everything, we'll never achieve anything. 
and um, it will take some time. There will be a lot of discussions and exchanges with uh, different um, at different foreign consultations with non-governmental sector for sure. But uh, we are aware that uh, it's a very complex approach, a very complex issue. It's really multifaceted and it needs a lot of uh, considerations with, uh, from different angles. Uh, on the non-paper, in fact, there are more than one non-papers for Porto so far. And uh, the commission is not planning to overtake the subsidiarity principle in our area. This is by far not the intention. If there is any intention on behalf of the member states, they can do this in by changing the treaty. But we are very much abide by we abide by the treaty. We know what are the limitations, and we are not going to overtake uh, the member states' responsibilities and powers. But uh, we we see that uh, there is in general support for uh, taking a coordinated EU level action and keeping the, the limitations that we have. And that's what we are going to do. We're not going to interfere in national systems. We have proposed the minimum uh, wage uh, uh, directive last year, but we are not proposing an European minimum wage. We are proposing that uh, may, we want to make sure that all member states have good systems which ensure a minimum wage, which allows for decent living for people that are working because it's uh, really not acceptable to have working poor who work eight hours a day. That's not acceptable. Um, the non-papers uh, of uh, different groupings of member states, in fact, uh, <laughs> they're like this, uh, uh, giving some indication and also giving us some food for thought on our initiatives, which will be part of the pillar, how to address them and uh, where we can be a bit more open and forward coming and where we're really not um, in a way uh, for the moment allowed to go push and uh, push strongly uh, at this stage. But I'm sure that uh, um, the solidarity principle was put at test, but it increased the solidarity. It did not decrease the solidarity. I think that now, uh, I'm not sure whether it was Mr. Van Rompuy who mentioned that uh, we have so many fatalities now after the COVID that uh, I don't think there is anyone who doesn't have a person, a friend, a relative who's been affected. So uh, I think that, uh, and you, somebody referred to the first very, for months, strong appreciation of social workers, of healthcare workers, clapping on the windows for, uh, I don't know how many months last year. And that created another feeling of, uh, a common, a need of common action. So I don't think that uh, the pandemic will destroy the solidarity. For me, it will bring an additional impetus to solidarity, to our re reconsideration of values, because we are now becoming a bit more susceptible about uh, very small good things in our lives that we really consider all the time as something that it's a normal thing to have, to be able to go out, to see your friends, relatives, and so on. Now, uh, we really don't care where somebody lives. We just want to see him. That's not a, um, a choice anymore. It's becoming a necessity. And uh, also, I think that uh, it's true that the COVID pandemic uh, put in additional vulnerability vulnerable people uh, because of many factors, external. But also, uh, it showed that uh, our need to act on homelessness is very much well argumented and justified because people who are homeless were even more exposed. And um, I think that uh, hopefully we will have one day something like the ordinary normal life. And uh, I'm absolutely believing that the people will find uh, a different approach to their lives, to their to their cooperation and uh, communication and working and living with others. Because now it's, uh, uh, I think that all tests are there for good, for something changing substantially in a qualitative way, um, people's lives and people themselves. Thank you. Heather, you wanted to come in? You're muted, yeah. Must always remember to unmute. unmute. 
I mean, I, there, there, as, as has been said, there's a number of non-papers, um, uh, but perhaps the most important paper is the proposal that's come from the Commission, um, because it's that that member states need to decide on, and the non-papers are, if I may, opinions uh, from some member states who will then gather around a table and uh, come to some sort of conclusion. And if I, if I had some concrete messages, it would be adopt the targets, adopt the scoreboard. It's, it's, the, first, it's, the, first, it's the first point. Um, but when uh, Adriana was speaking earlier on, I, I, I sort of I raised my eyes slightly because she said that the 2020 uh, targets uh, previously hadn't been reached because of, of other outside influences. But I don't necessarily agree because when they started, Member states only committed, for example, the target on poverty to reduce poverty by 20 million. Member states only agreed to targets that amounted to 11 million. It was it was it was doomed to failure from the beginning. So whatever these non papers say and, and whatever is decided, can member states be honest in what they agree to? If they're going to to adopt a target, then they agree to actually do something towards that target. Um, because that is what I think annoys people across Europe, is that we get a lot of rhetoric about solidarity, but there's no meat on the bone when it comes to solidarity. Member states are, are quite willing to be, to some degree, somewhat patronising towards individual member states, but not necessarily recognise the, the, the wider solidarity across 27. It's easier to look down on one than to look in a circle, I think, uh, we, at each other. Um, so that's what I would, would like to encourage uh, member states to actually, to actually do. And the word that was brought up earlier on was, um, by Mr. Van Rompuy as well was resilience. And I think that needs to be at the heart of the discussions in Porto is resilience. And, and what wasn't mentioned was the resilience of individual people. Because at the end of the day, that's what we talk about, is about people. But one of the things we've seen in the past year is looking at how we build up the resilience of the social services sector to be resilient in times of crisis. And there are things that we can learn as well. You know, it's not we're saying everything was hard because of others. We also have to look internally. But how do we build that resilience? if we're not willing to take the chance to have targets and a commitment and a social scoreboard that is committed to by member states. And yes, I don't think we've got any chance of treaty change right now when it comes to social policy, but there are carrots and sticks. And that includes the recovery and resilience facility that uh, Adriana already mentioned, the European Social Fund Plus, and what we then need to see is member states taking their portal commitment and reflecting that in how they're going to use EU funds and the European Commission being tough, frankly, and sticking to its lines of saying we want resilient social services, we want social services that will achieve uh, quality employment. And, and the other things that have, have been mentioned. But we've got to use that sort of tri, I was gonna say tripartite, but that infers something else in the social context, but use that uh, combination of the, the providers of the services, the users of the services, the commission and member states to actually put pressure on each other to see what's actually needed. So I, I have many more things I can say, but I'll, 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 I'll let maybe you ask another question. <laughs> Well, I, I have several hundred, but uh, apparently, <laughs> apparently the audience also have some. So uh, maybe we'll we'll go we'll go to um, Andre Bonello uh, to uh, ask a question. Um, my colleagues will just uh, give you the floor so you can ask yours. Okay, you should be. Yeah. Um, hello, Hi. I am from Malta. Um, I am from um, the Caritas organization. Um, very interesting presentation. Thank you all. And I take care of the Department of Research and Advocacy. Um, as you can, as you know, um, 
when you work in an organization like Caritas, um, although I work on research, I had to step out of my role and go in the streets during the pandemic and distribute food to those who are in need. And this was as a researcher um, and doing most of the job um, behind um, a desk, it was a shock for me to see the, um, the pain that people are going through. And as a researcher, I have spoken to the people and the people have told me that the minimum wage is not enough, was never enough for them to live decently in, in, in our country and in Malta. So um, I have thought and given it thought and the European Pillar of Social Rights, um, uh, the 14th um, pillar says, uh, talks about the minimum income. And it is very important that um, we speak not only about a living wage, we must speak about a living income. We've been speaking about this. Unfortunately, the European Union, maybe even in the European Parliament, we speak about the environment, sustainability, about protecting our earth, but do we give priority to our people? And when I go to distribute together with my colleagues, the food and I speak to the people, the people are sad because they do not have the essentials to live decently. So as Caritas Malta, we issued a series of reports on how to live decently. And we named them a minimum, a minimum essential budget for a decent living. So one of the recommendations that we have given was that the European Union, together with um, its member states, they must create um, and revise, for example, the 60% median national equivalent income as a, as a benchmark to define at risk of poverty by increasing it um, to 100, in my opinion, but at least increasing it to a 70%. This is the first task. Secondly, um, we must can, you, create, can you just keep it shorter because we're not yes, so much time. We must create various national research um, uh, institutions to research poverty. And lastly, I will close with this. It is important to keep advocating for those um, who are in need to get the, the right necessities and um, services for them to live decently. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know uh, if anybody wants to respond to that. Uh, Heather, if you want to start. I mean, I'm happy to start. I'm sure others have something to say, but I, I just want to make a point um, around minimum income and social services. And, and it's maybe one of the, the weaknesses we see in the pillar um, across our, our coordinated action is that the, the way that the action plan on the pillar has been designed is it's rather vert vertical. It's sort of, here's the principles and these are the things that we're doing. And what we're missing, as much as we, we might like what is on in the pillar, we feel there's things missing. And it's a horizontal approach. And that's where social services come in, because actually to achieve the majority of what's in the pillar, um, as has already been said, you have to have high quality, accessible, affordable social services. But that's not mentioned anywhere, really, only long term care. And there's, we don't feel that there's enough emphasis on, on how to build up those social services. But we can be smart with this because what we want to see is a positive ecosystem for social services. And let me take that example about minimum income and adequacy of minimum income. We absolutely support that. But when local authorities are tendering services at prices that only allow particularly um, social service providers with a, a, a very depends on the structure they have, but let's say not for profit, but it's not only, but with a very low um, sort of financial background. They're only able to contract those services by paying minimum wages. And there is no money for training, for upskilling, for everything that the Commission wants to do with the ease instrument. There's no fiscal space 
There's no contract space in public contracts to do that. So we're stuck in this situation of wanting to upskill our workers, wanting to pay higher wages, all the things that the Commission wants to do in the pillar of social rights. But other instruments like public procurement, like state aid, are actually barriers to us. Like looking at the fiscal rules in the stability and growth path. And if we were to be able to take a horizontal approach with social services across the pillar, we could ident identify a number of these underpinning areas that could then be addressed and we could move forward and we could find the, the additional staff that we need. I think it's 8% we know we'll need to grow the sector staff wise by 8% over the next 10 years. We need highly qualified staff. We need gender diversity in our staff. But most of all, we want to pay them well. This is a really important job. And at the moment, we have to often pay low. And that makes it seem as if it's a, it's a job that's not worthwhile. So, so we want to work on minimum income. But then let's look at why we can't pay higher um, wages. Because of things like public procurement rules and the lack of using social criteria in those. Well, Jakob, I think you wanted to come in. Yeah, I'm very happy to, to hear what Heather just said, because it's uh, I think it's very true. Um, the salaries as they are, the working conditions as they are, are um, just simply not making the profession very attractive to people. And especially now during COVID, uh, we heard quite a few unions saying that actually many workers in social services are considered leaving the profession. So rather than actually adding on workers, which you would need, looking at the demographic forecast, we're actually um, losing them or at least not gaining them at a, at a fast enough rate. And of course, from our side as unions, it's also important to mention that um, it's also key for workers to organize, um, to organize in unions, to um, have strong collective bargaining rounds also with the employers. And I think also here that you can play a role in supporting it, for instance, with the minimum wage directive, where they're um, would be a, a provision for uh, for social um, for collective agreement coverage, and um, maybe also to get back on what has been said on um, the the poverty. I think from our colleague the the poverty of many workers. Uh, I think also here it's um, social services are are key to to alleviate poverty for many people. Also in terms of reaching the headline targets of the. Um, of the action plan. For instance, if we want to really look at um, bringing more women into employment, we actually need uh, more social services um, because at the moment, a lot of infer most informal care is done by women, which oftentimes doesn't allow them to reconciliate with, uh, with working life. So also here, it's, uh, it shows how important it is to have more stuff and that that necessarily means to offer better working conditions. Thank you, Jakob. Um, yeah, in, indeed. I think probably, Andriana, you, you might want to come come back on that as well. Um, there's also, um, you know, yeah, indeed, as Heather mentioned, the, the sort of wider questions regarding the recovery, resilience facility, the stability and growth pact. I mean, uh, in terms of uh, allowing member states to make the sort of social investments that they need to make in, in a lot of these sectors, I mean, are we really having to look at at least some sort of revision of understanding of the stability and growth pact in, in, in order to allow them to have the flexibility or are we as, as Mr Van Rompuy mentioned in his speeches earlier you know that this sort of shadow of austerity hanging over us that in a few years you know even if they make the investments now you know they're going to have their eye on the future and the fact that they're going to have to suddenly uh, control spending in, in a few years time I mean I just wonder if you have any um, comments to make on, on that as well. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it was interesting to listen to the interventions now. Uh, Heather, you are right. We didn't achieve uh, the 20 million less in poverty, but we achieved 12, not 11. So I think that was also a good achievement. But that was a lot, a lot of strong push, you know. Any, um, any spending under the European budgets, uh, funds under shared management was so carefully directed to make sure that uh, whatever we do has as a secondary result, reducing the number of people at risk of poverty and social exclusion. 
And uh, that's why we are now focusing on children because we want to start providing access to children from their early age and breaking this uh, cycle of poverty, which goes for generations. We'll try and we'll give it another try. I'm sure we had in 2013, this investment in children recommendation, which uh, was not, uh, it was only a council, a commission recommendation and member states didn't take it up so strongly. That's why we're now going for a council recommendation with mo more commitment by the council, by the member states to these uh, decisions. So, um, I know that uh, Europe should be a model of uh, a fair and equal society, equal opportunities first, and then uh, good and decent living uh, uh, possibilities. And uh, the colleague from Malta, I know that uh, it's really painful to go and uh, work for the distribution of food and basic material assistance to people because after that, you're really feeling so kind of. Um, guilty that somebody is in this situation and you you're not doing enough but uh, that's why we had the FAD program i didn't mention it it's now uh, towards the end but member states uh, i think for the moment we have uh, more than half of the member states will be allocating additional amounts of uh, their react to you uh, additional envelope towards uh, support with basic material assistance for people in need and uh, I thought that this very small fund, which was only 3.5 billion for seven years, for 28 member states, this small fund made a big change because uh, some of your members are also part of the implementation of the FAIR uh, programs in member states. They're the partner organizations. They're also uh, as being in touch directly with uh, those that are most deprived have become uh, a natural partner to uh, the managing authorities and the uh, national authorities in charge of the implementation of the FED. But uh, I also think that uh, this uh, small fund raised the awareness and also uh, consolidated national forces for addressing uh, the needs of the most deprived people. I know that uh, we could have done the action plan in many different ways, Heather, I know. It's vertical, that's a decision. It could have been horizontal, but for the commission and especially for our DG, it's so important that we have social dialogue, that we keep uh, collective bargaining anywhere that we can uh, really push and introduce it. And this is becoming uh, one of the key actions uh, with the very soft skills. We, we cannot uh, impose anything on member states, but uh, we are trying to give models, to give uh, good examples so that uh, showing what has happened, but also what the result has been of some changes in uh, cooperation and uh, collective bargaining mechanisms. So uh, I understand that uh, uh, in some member states, uh, in not probably not very few, quite a number of member states when uh, social services um, at very local level are tendered out, then there's no margin. I know this is uh, really, sometimes you wonder when you hear the unit price or unit cost to say, what do you expect with this? This is really a joke. Uh, but this is again something that uh, the commission cannot change. We can help if a national authority or regional authority is given the freedom to decide or to program a certain uh, budget from the EU budget, which is given to the country, they can choose, they can make a choice, but we cannot impose. We have a lot of discussions even now on the recovery and resilience plans, uh, first uh, drafts and uh, latest drafts, and those already received few uh, final uh, proposals on uh, the importance of having the social aspect well reflected, well covered by reforms first, and then the necessary investments, because investments without reforms are not sustainable. And we are talking about resilience, and we cannot expect any resilience of our society if uh, we have some investments which are not uh, substantiated uh, or based on reforms that can really deliver a big change thinking about uh, all the possibilities and there are so many um, additional opportunities currently for making uh, social services i i love the idea about the long-term care initiative because there we also are thinking how to reflect the technological development 
because we have to, to take it up. We cannot uh, expect uh, an exponential increase of um, service providers if we can use some of the technological development results for helping people that need to live independently, that we want to ensure that they live independently. So uh, it is a big challenge uh, to have the proper assessment of what we can do. Uh, also, we all know we are limited. We are not going to apologize for that. <laughs> for that's a fact, that's the treaty. So even our ambitions are sometimes uh, limited or hold back by the member states. We have very difficult discussions now with uh, the minimum wage directive, with the child guarantee recommendation. It's really a lot of work uh, with the member states because they also consider that uh, if they take a, a commitment on something, if they're serious, they have to deliver. So they're trying to assess. The fiscal aspect of the budgets we cannot avoid. <laughs> it's, um, I've been in discussions with DPC a few years ago about uh, uh, social investments to be taken out of uh, the evaluation of budget deficits and so on. Still nowhere. But uh, th there should be a different balance achieved, I believe. It's not that we totally disregard fiscal stability. We cannot do that. But we have to rebalance somehow the uh, fiscal stability and the social side of the economy. Thank you. Yeah, indeed. Um, we're talking about resilience. Uh, then, you know, as there's, was said by Mr. Van Rompuy to start with, you know, the, the lack of social investment has eroded resilience to, to lead us to a pandemic. And, you know, um, they're definitely, if, if there's not a time now to have these discussions, then when, when will there be? Um, I want to, at this point, uh, although we have still a lot of questions to get through, I want to bring in um, uh, Emanuelita from Caritas Crotone to give a presentation, um, really giving us an idea of, of the situation on the ground. I think building on indeed the question we had from, from Malta. Um, Manuelita, if you want to, to make your presentation, then we'll, we'll come back to some of the questions in the Q&A. Thank you. Good afternoon. Just one second. I'm going to show a PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Can you see? Yeah. Okay. So first of all, I would like to say a welcome, honor that I am to be with you today to share with you our experience as Caritas at the, lo at the local level. Since as Caritas, we see firsthand the impact on people in the most vulnerable situations. I'm the deputy director of Caritas Crotone in the very south of Italy. Uh, Caritas is a truly sensitive and reliable indicator of the social and economic situation in various countries due to its extreme capillary nature, since Caritas is in fact subdivided into national, regional and local bodies, with a presence therefore even in the smallest parishes and most remote rural communities. We are often the first point of contact for people who experience poverty or exclusion. What we call the Caritas Poverty and Resource Observatories are a unique and accurate tool to systematically alert on situation of poverty, as well as to collect data about the response system implemented by institutions to contrast social vulnerability. What do the data referring to this period of the pandemic tell us? Caritas Italiana carried out three national monitorings in 2020, one in April in full lockdown, the second in June after the reopening original borders, and the third in September after the, sum, after the summer period. The information collected through the first two surveys, April and June, testifies to the effect of the health crisis and the consequent socioeconomic repercussions. Over three months between March and May, the Caritas net network recorded a sharp increase in the number of people supported at regional and parish level. Overall, there, are, there were about 450,000 additional people turning to, our, uh, to Caritas, often spokespeople for the requested needs of the entire family unit. The data already a significant increase is still definitely underestimated. Among the people seeking assistance, many are new poor, that is people who have for the first time experienced such condition of hardship and economic deprivation that they finally were forced to ask for help. In my region, Calabria, which is one of the most complex and fragile regions of the Italian territory, 
we observed very early on an increase in the number of families that turned to our help centers, and many for the first time. These are people who were working, who were suddenly without an income because they belonged to the most affected business, category, including stores, bars, cafe, or because they belonged to unprotected categories such as seasonal workers, precarious workers, undocumented workers. Alongside these families, there were many migrants as well, caregivers, day laborers, and migrants waiting for the renewal of their per work permits who have been stuck in a bureaucratic and above all economic limbo. Unable to move, unable to work, even on the strictest days of the first lockdown, lockdown, we were forced to keep the homeless shelter open due to the continuous pressure of people who were suddenly left homeless and jobless and who had nowhere else to go. As the month went by, the request became more, more varied. If in the early days most turned to us for food and utility bills, over time new difficulties emerged. Related to, for example, supporting school education for children and young people who did not have electronic devices or internet, psychological problems, family crisis and problems of domestic abuse, health problems related to the impossibility of accessing timely care and visit or simply diagnostic tests. We have often tried to respond creatively to all these emergencies, as we were also adapting to the new situation created by the pandemic. In my context, for example, we have remotely continued the activities of the Center for Children with Cognitive and Behavioral Difficulties by buying families kits that would allow work from home or by training parents to become ed educator assistants. We have activated a hotline providing psychological and health counseling or just advice. We are producing masks with the girls engaged in our solidarity tailor tailoring project. We have entered into an agreement with a partner for the distribution of personal protective equipment and medicines. Our volunteer doctors are providing remote assistance. We are helping with job placement, placement retraining and job search support. And we have supported local companies by offering work for studies and agreements for training, internship, and apprenticeships. As we are still in the midst of the crisis, with an upsurge of the pandemic in recent days, it is difficult to take stock of how much of an impact COVID-19 has had in terms of increased absolute poverty or, and relative poverty, in terms of unemployment and educational, education poverty. The data we have so far indicate exponential increases in all of these indicators within our territory. And this urges us to prepare not only emergency responses, but also strategic intervention plans to face what is no longer an isolated problem, but an epochal change in our society. What we have learned from the very first few months of the pandemic is that a weak health system in some of its services or in some geographical areas can hold up well in good times, but does not withstand the shock away of a period of crisis. Even in our work on the ground, we immediately face the lack of care and support service to respond to the needs of the most fragile, fragile the elderly and sick people. The lack of a well-distributed care system had the consequent overloading the central system in the hospitals. We also realized that we needed a network that would not be only health related, but also social related, because from the very first moments, the emergency for many families was also and above all economic and social. The pandemic has made it clear that a transition from a declared human right into an effective one is not automatic. And this will be important to keep in mind as Europe takes further steps to implement the European pillar of social rights. After the first day of this May, we have, uh, throughout Italy, activated services that have allowed people to feel closer to us while maintaining distance. Telephone counseling service, medical and psychological consultation by video conference, assistance for distance learning for children with physical or cognitive disabilities, economic support for families who were suddenly left without income and without a social security cushion take away canteen service and also redesigned the dormitory service to respond to the new health protocols. 
we have therefore learned at an economic and human cost how fragile and extremely precarious the situation is for a large number of people and families who in normal time, times would still manage to keep themselves safely, relatively safely above the poverty line. We have also worked hard to demonstrate by means of our example that care understood as closeness, attention, listening and proximity is the only possible response to keep a con community cohesive and to promote inter integral human development. The experience of the pandemic has also strengthened us even more in our conviction that it's of fundamental importance to invest in public welfare that services such as ours can be complementary, supportive, but must be necessarily placed, with, placed within a wider framework of solid national and European social policies. There is a need to recognize the fundamental contribution that social service providers have made throughout the pandemic. The situation has been very serious for people in the most marginalized situations who depend on our services. But it would have been a much more serious situation had we not worked 24 7 to continue to support throughout the pandemic. What would Europe and the authorities across Europe have done if we had not been there when the crisis hit? And how can we emerge from the crisis without supporting those very same social services properly? Some lessons learned are, however, positive, as we know, and are to be built on for the future. The most essential one is that the pandemic has brought to us the awareness on how interdependent we are. Now, if I were to leave a word as a conclusion to my speech, this is the word I would choose, interconnection. We are all intimately linked to each other, the life of one with the lives of many, the destiny of a community with the destiny of all. The pandemic reminded us of this in the most brutal possible way. We are here or save it together on a one set. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. That was a really interesting presentation. It really hits home just how 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 much we've depended on services, social services of all types over the, well, especially over the last year. And actually how much uh, I think it's 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 fair to say that. The, the brunt of the austerity measures we've been cushioned because of the dedication of people working in the social or healthcare education sector um, the the knowledge that these people will not let others fall because of the cuts that have been inflicted on them I mean I, I think it's a, it's a, a fair a fair observation um, aware that we have a lot of questions to get through um, uh, I wonder, Indeed, uh, to start with, having a look at uh, the, you know, the the monitoring implementation of the pillar from here. Um, yeah, we, we have the Porto Summit, and hopefully there'll be some interesting uh, conclusions to it. But you know, where do we go from here in terms of of the monitoring of the implementation? Indeed, um, uh, Matthias, uh, project um, a policy and project coordinator for Social Services Europe, has asked um, to Heather particularly, how can or should the Commission makes sure that not for profit social service providers and their national European umbrella organizations are fully involved in all steps of the implementation of the pillar of action plan, uh, i.e. in the related policy and legislative initiatives, as well as in the monitoring processes at EU level. I mean, maybe we'll start with Heather, but uh, Andriana, if you want to come in on that afterwards. Yeah, thanks very much. And, and really a huge thank you to Manuelita to remind us what we're talking about. And um, something struck me, Manuelita, Man, Manuelita said, we're still in the midst of the crisis. And I think that's important to remember that um, the crisis didn't end when the clapping on the streets ended. Um, it, we're in a different phase, I think, of, of, of crisis at the moment. And we're maybe in the social services sector seeing a bit more stability in how we can do our work. But it doesn't mean to say that things have gone back to normal, far from it. And I, I think that what Manuelita also uh, referred to as the legacy, that the long-term effects that we're not seeing yet of the, the crisis are, are really important for us to remember. And that's why, as we go into the potential adoption of the action plan of targets and of the scoreboard, we need to bear that in mind when it comes to, to monitoring and evaluation. We're not finished yet. 
We don't know what the outcome of this crisis will be, and nor do we know what the next crisis will be. And that's the other thing that we, we, we do have that change of, of normality now. We, we have recognized how fragile our globalized world is, and indeed the interdependence and the interaction and, and how what happens on the other side of the world will have a massive effect on us. So I think that was really important to hear from you, Manuelita. Um, so when it comes then to measuring the pillar, um, assuming the targets will be adopted as the commission has proposed. And I, 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 I want to stress, I actually I agree with very much of what Adriana has said today, <laughs> but I always enjoy a good discussion. Um, but how are we going to get member states to be accountable for those targets? I think that was one of the challenges in the 2020 strategy was how to ensure that they would be accountable for them, not just adopt them, but be accountable for them. And I think that's still a piece of work that will have to be happening in the, in the coming weeks. The scoreboard and the expanded scoreboard will help, but it doesn't have everything in it. I mean, there is a lack of desegregated data um, to be reported. I think something that Manuelita was, was hinting towards as well was recognizing that there's specific groups that require specific assistance and targeted assistance and outreach measures um, that's not particularly reflected in the scoreboard, but is reflected in other things such as the National Roma um, strategies. So it's how to align a lot of the different ways of gathering data that are out there at the moment and how to measure the intersectionality of um, discrimination that's experienced by many people, for example, accessing social services and the uh, barriers um, to accessing services, for example, financial. So there's a lot of intersectionalities that we need to find ways to monitor as well. I think a very specific point that we would make from the coordinating, um, the coordinating action group is that a secondary indicator in the scoreboard refers to uh, services, but is a little bit narrow at, on long-term care services. And we would like to see that enlarged because as you were saying, Manolita, your services have gone beyond traditional long-term care services during the pandemic. They have been ensuring that young people get assistance with their education, that families uh, who have potential for crisis are, are kept stable. That is more than long-term care. So we, we also need to see how to make some of those secondary indicators a bit broader. And then finally, I would say we need to work with Eurostat because one of the problems, and this is where I think that our sector could work in partnership with the Commission very well, is identifying what data we don't have. And then how do we either provide that data as additional information alongside the social scoreboard or work jointly with Eurostat to find ways to collect that data. So I think that once the scoreboard as a whole is adopted, and the targets, we need to sit down and look at how we work together. And the final point is indeed, our sector has to be part of the development, the implementation, the monitoring and the evaluation of all policies that affect the provision of social services at EU, at national, at regional and at local level. That is absolutely essential. If we're going to do it well, let's co-design it co-evaluate it, and then co-review it. I wonder, actually, before Andriana uh, replies, maybe Jakob wants to come in also on the social scoreboard um, and, and, yeah, the, the proposed revisal of the social scoreboard, but also potentially as well looking at the recovery and resilience plans and that Heather's talking about the importance of the implementation of the pillar. Um, but I wonder, you know, if we're actually also seeing enough um engagement at national level particularly with you know social partners civil society organizations ngos on the formulation of the recovery resilience plans you know to ensure that the social elements are actually being put forward at the local you know at the, at the from grassroots to make that message it's not just coming from the commission telling the member states to do more on social but it's also coming from the bottom up but are are, are we getting the opportunities to you know to speak from from the ground Thanks a lot for your question, Laura. 
Um, I think on the scoreboard, really, Heather said a lot of things that I um, wouldn't necessarily have to add to myself. But perhaps on the broader question of data, which I think was quite interesting, is that we also really had this issue with a lack of data during COVID on the infections among social care workers. We were working together last year also with Amnesty International on, um, they were doing a research project that we were involved in and that we presented last summer. Um, on uh, social care and health and social care workers during COVID. And one thing that really transpired is just that there is not much data. And that was actually one of our key demands, uh, one of our main demands during the crisis is that we need to improve this data collection also on the European level, also by strengthening the European uh, Center for Disease Prevention and Control to actually know uh, what we're looking at, which in the end is the only thing that allows us to formulate better um, policy responses. Uh, so that is, I think, actually a very important point that also uh, goes back to strengthening the resilience of the sector. Um, the second point on the involvement of social partners in, um, in uh, recovery and resilience funds, I, I agree that this is uh, certainly a problem. In many countries, this has not sufficiently happened, even though there is uh, the requirement that they be... Um, they should be um, included. But for instance, in Austria, where I myself come from, this has been done in a very formal way. Um, so I know from the Austrian Trade Union Confederation that there has been um, that they there has been only one one brief call where they said it was a very pro forma type of an uh, inclusion without any real type of feedback, which I think in the end is also represented in the fact that in many in many countries, uh, social services and healthcare services are not are not that well included. Um, I think the two, the two to go together, a lack of consultation, which in the end also results in a lack of um, inclusion of the care sector. Uh, so this to, to your two questions. Thank you. Yeah, I'll give the floor to Andriana if you want to come back. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I agree that <clears throat> we have uh, a task to follow up on uh, once the targets and the scoreboard are approved next week that we have to follow up on uh, how member states are contributing to achieving the EU level targets. First, they have to identify their national targets and then the reporting on the national targets progress is measured through the European semester. And this will continue to be the case. So uh, with the national reform programs, the member states will be reporting on uh, their progress on uh, implementation, but also uh, we have the, um, the same problem with data <laughs> and we are trying to uh, when we were developing the more detailed uh, secondary indicators we were always trying to look at what can we get at EU level because uh, for homelessness there's no data we will be using uh, now the setting up of the platform to get a better picture of exactly the dimension of the problem uh, but for some of the secondary indicators, the colleagues are now discussing in EMCO and the Social Protection Committee uh, what is uh, possible. And also we are in constant uh, exchange with Eurostat to understand uh, whatever member state data collection is available and how uh, Eurostat can get these data. But of course, uh, they have the additional uh, requirement that the methodology for data collection should be the same so that summarizing the data should be something uh, which makes sense. We're not adding pairs and depots, that we're adding only pairs in uh, an indicator at EU level. So uh, this is a process which uh, we are slowly progressing on, but uh, as I say, it's not easy, it's not quick. And we cannot ask Eurostat to collect data, which is collected in different uh, ways in the member states because it's not gonna be comparable and it's not gonna be correct. On uh, the follow-up on uh, the actions of the pillar in terms of um, legal instruments, we have the public consultations, and this is, we are obliged by the better regulation uh, to have public consultations on anything. Uh, so any, uh, any initiative or any legal text should be made available to uh, anyone who is interested in it and uh, given the chance to uh, also express an opinion. And uh, we will be having given very short uh, deadlines to compile all the uh, responses received after consultation and prepare a report uh, what are these proposals, uh, what of these proposals we can implement and introduce in uh, our legal proposal and what we cannot and why. Um, on the implementation of uh, 
initiatives locally, uh, I mentioned the creation of the help desk, especially with uh, giving the possibility to social service providers to learn uh, better and understand better the process of accessing funds. But as long as these funds are part of the programs. So uh, there, uh, some of you mentioned correctly that it is not uh, only the commission, but there should be a pressure inside the member states for making sure that these are uh, sort of priorities and they're also identified in the programs for the next period. Um, on the, I think that discrimination is uh, one of the main, main principles of spending of any European budget. And this is uh, underlined even stronger in the uh, horizontal enabling conditions and uh, we'll be very closely monitoring that um, no cases where there is a discrimination applied or uh, a preference given to a target group in a uh, project funded by the funds is there because there should be really uh, at least whatever the European budget is spending on should be compliant with the Charter of Fundamental Rights, basic and horizontal and uh, relevant principles, and that uh, there is no breach of the Charter in relation to non to discrimination or to uh, gender equality or any other of these principles that are there. So uh, we will be monitoring uh, the regular reporting on uh, and the monitoring committees on the implementation of uh, the operations funded by the funds, but also the principle is now part of the uh, spending not only under the SF plus but also under the uh, European Regional Development Fund cohesion fund uh, the funds of DG home the asylum migration fund the internal security fund and also DG Mare the European maritime fisheries and aquaculture fund so uh, the principles of uh, non-discrimination are already part of the majority of the spending of the European budget, because what is directly uh, implemented by the uh, Commission is already very closely watched for not, not allowing any uh, situations of uh, discrimination. We have also uh, introduced the responsibility for member states to have a system of complaints if there is a discrimination. And also uh, people have the possibility to complain to the Commission directly if they feel that they have been discriminated in one way or another and the commission can take action and also um, not fund projects which have created such uh, situations. So um, for non-discrimination uh, principle, uh, we are very sensitive about it, absolutely. No grounds for discrimination whatsoever. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to come to Maria Beckermeyer now, who's been waiting oh so patiently to ask her, to ask the questions. Uh, Maria, um, my colleagues uh, are muting. Yeah, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Um, yes, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello, thank you. Um, thank you for listening to me. Um, I would have uh, two questions for Mrs. Sokova. Um, the first is um, about an uh, initiative mentioned by her on social services. Uh, when she first uh, made the presentation. I mean, uh, I was, of course, I'm teleworking and I really miss that, so I would like to understand what it is about, because, of course, the um, European pillar of social rights is um, doesn't make any reference to social services, as we all know. So uh, this is why a uh, commission initiative would be most welcome. This is my little comment to the question. And then a second question is something that worries me an awful lot is about how to fund the, um, the implementation of the European Pillar of Social Rights. All I read in the action plan, of course, um, is about uh, is about, uh, is about the, the role of the ESIF fund, an ESIF, um, you know, structural and investment fund, in particular um, ESF plus with its uh, 88 billion or 98, I don't know more, no, never mind. And then I was wondering, um, I mean, I know, I mean, I, I have, I have, I have read also that the recovery and resilience facility does not really has uh, the vocation to uh, implement the pillar, but leaving it all to the ESF plus, 
I mean, uh, for the period until, until 27. I mean, does the commission think this will be enough? Um, because for the implementation of the pillar, money will be needed for the whole tw uh, 20 principles, really. So um, I don't know, uh, what could be uh, Mr. Sukova's comments on this? Um, because without funding, there's no way forward. And um, uh, lately I heard a little bit about a new program called SERVE, and that would be the program for um, uh, to tackle non-discrimination actions and everything. I mean, of course, the child poverty and women and uh, gender equality, it's all supposed to be covered by that. Gender-based violence, I mean, you name it. I mean, it's such a confusion and it's such a shame that the action plan is not clear at all, to my eyes at least, about the funding, about new funding, about, because of course, the talking about 1.8 trillion is also is very nice, but we have understood that these are for, I mean, for jobs or education, but when we talk education, again, you talk uh, ESF plus, when you talk new jobs, you also talk ESF. So there is, unfortunately, there is a lot of clarity in this, and I would really appreciate, um, more clarity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria, and thank you for your for your patience there uh, to, to answer your question. Um, also, just to tie in uh, before you respond, uh, Andriana uh, Freak Spinawain from uh, Fianza is also asking about uh, specifically funding for the EU homelessness platform. Um, so again, I, I think that sort of tie, ties in a little bit with that last question. So uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, in fact, uh, on the social services, it's not exactly the social services we are preparing and working on an action plan for the social economy. And it uh, touches upon the social services, of course, which will be presented by the end of this year and uh, which will focus on facilitating um, the work of social enterprises operating in the field of social services as well. So uh, this is... Uh, of course, we cannot identify all the sectors uh, in uh, one document, but uh, we think that the uh, social economy has a place uh, in uh, many sectors of the economy. It's not uh, uh, limited to social service providers, so it's going to be a broader one. I know that uh, there is a lot of interest on the funding uh, possibilities and availability. Let me start by explaining uh, the difference of 88 and 98. 88 billion euro is in 2018 prices and 98 billion is in uh, current prices. So um, this is a budgetary uh, technique of calculating uh, the money available. But um, first, uh, the future European Social Fund Plus encompasses the current European Social Fund activities, adds the Youth Employment Initiative, and also the Fund for European Aid to the Most Deprived. So uh, we have merged everything together in one fund to allow for um, specific objectives that are relevant for all this uh, group together uh, funds. And uh, we have ended up in uh, the ESF plus regulation currently with 13 specific objectives. So they go to employment, providing uh, upskilling and reskilling, uh, continuous vocational education and training, support for access to employment, be it through, uh, through uh, self-employment or uh, supporting, finding a job. Uh, the second part is social inclusion measures, including for marginalized groups, vulnerable groups, and uh, Roma. And the third uh, group is about um, uh, education and training, access to education, access to early childhood education and care and so on. So, uh, all these 13 specific objectives are matched with the principles and rights of the pillar of social rights. And that's, uh, that's why we say that the European Social Fund is the main funding instrument for that. It is implemented, of course, with the member states because the commission is managing 4% of this fund. No, 0.35%, 0.35% of the ESI funds is managed by the commission. The rest is managed by the member states. And uh, that's why the involvement of uh, partners is very important when the priorities are set up in the programs and uh, the main projects identified and operations identified in the programs so that they are really uh, directed to something that's 
bringing a change and making a sustainable change. Um, the RRF is, uh, in fact, uh, having an obligation, uh, introducing an obligation in Article 29 that uh, we report to the Council and Parliament on uh, the support for the social activities. And uh, within uh, three of the six pillars identified in the RRF, uh, we have identified uh, what are the possible types of investments and we'll be monitoring uh, the member states uh, once now we, are, we start receiving the recovery and resilience plans. We'll be monitoring what is programmed for these type of activities, again, in these uh, three uh, areas. And uh, we will be monitoring whenever payment claims come from the member states, which are the milestones and targets achieved in these respective, um, they're called components in the RRPs, uh, because we have to report uh, every year to uh, the Council and Parliament out of the overall budget of the RRF, what has been spent on social aspects. Uh, the New self is an, the old rights and values program. So it's a citizenship, European rights and values code now. And it's a very small program. It's not uh, in a way even uh, envisaged for, um, uh, it's a very limited scope and a very limited budget. So I wouldn't rely, rely on that to bring the change of the, uh, of the action plan implementation on the ground. It has a very, uh, how to say, focused uh, investment. And uh, I don't think we have uh, considered that as uh, involving it for the implementation of the pure. Uh, it is a centrally managed uh, program and uh, it's the Justice who is managing uh, this. We are also very closely working with DG AAC in relation to education because uh, we have vocational education and training, upskilling and reskilling, but uh, we also have with DSF uh, plus the possibility to support access to education for early childhood care, childhood uh, education, or for uh, preventing early school leaving. So uh, we are supporting the policy development in the area of education uh, because it is very important that uh, without a good general education and the good uh, specific education, uh, it will be not easy to find a job uh, on the labor market afterwards. So um, the, the constant development of the labor market needs and the need to develop the educational systems and the curricula are all the time there. So uh, we are trying to help both the training organizations, the educational system, but also uh, matching the labor market's needs with uh, setting up um, cooperations between uh, businesses and business organizations with uh, the um, educational system to make sure that uh, what education delivers is the, the same as needed for the uh, labor market and by the companies in the member states. So there I'll stop. Yeah, thank you. Thank um, you. Just keeping an eye on the clock, uh, I, I wonder, maybe I just come to Jakob and Heather just for any um, final comments on some of the things that have just been discussed, and, and then we'll, we'll go to Luke. Uh, yeah, I can go first. I mean, I, I very much share what Adriana has just said about the use of funds, and also perhaps to clarify, um, social services are mentioned in the action plan of the pillar. The point that we've been making in the coordinating action group is, is we would like to see more. We would like to see specific actions on social services because they support everything. So, so maybe if I'm thinking a little bit ambitiously, in a year's time, we'll be discussing, <coughs> excuse me, an open consultation on an action plan on social services um, that might follow up from the, the uh, action plan that's adopted on the pillar and we'll actually look at how it supports the implementation of the pillar. And that's something to take away with us um, and, and to think about. Um, but to absolutely support the, the initiative that is coming from the Commission on a help desk, because one of the, the major challenges is for social service uh, organisations, providers, to actually get hold of the funds that the Commission are trying to make available and to cut through 
the still existing bureaucracy, although much has been done on simplification, it can still seem like a mountain to climb um, in, in some ways for uh, particularly local and regional level providers. So having some sort of help desk, I think is, is good. Again, it's another enabling condition that will support the ambition of the pillar of social rights. So we look forward to that happening. I think another interesting thing for the future is this high level group that's proposed in the action plan on welfare systems and social services must be part of that. Um, and looking at how those welfare systems are resilient. I'm reminded again of what Manuelita was saying and realizing that actually we often only see the strongest when we're at our weakest. So as the crisis weakened our society, we saw what really was strong and what wasn't. And I think that's the, the approach we have to take for welfare states, for social services for the future. How strong will they be at our weakest point? Not how strong are they when we feel everything's going okay? Um, and that's maybe a bit about a renewed thinking. And, and that's what we have to come to in social services as well. Um, very much the involvement of social service um, organizations, as I said before, co-designing, co-production, and also with the users of those services. I don't mean to exclude them in saying that. We, we should be all in it together. And then we'll come up with the right approaches and find the right ways to use public procurement and contracting and the right ways to spend budgets. And we could go into whole discussions around participatory budgeting as well in, in local communities. And what was mentioned as well right, was around the balance between um, economic and social priorities. And we have heard a lot more about finding that balance. And the, the crisis did shift that slightly. But as we come back to a more normalized semester process, we need to come back to that balance again. So I think those are things that we're, we're really keen to see. Um, but I, I agree entirely that this is also down to member states. And I suppose, we need some sort of super league. Super leagues have been in the news a little bit recently. But, but what is it that, who, where, what is the super league of, of social services in Europe? Where are the best ecosystems, the best financial systems, the best contracting approaches, the best uses of public procurement? We need to be finding that. And if it's not happening, we need to be finding ways together to get member states to change those systems, to improve them, um, to, to innovate, to do something different. Because if we don't, the next time, and there will be a next time, we have the danger that social services will, will be even more affected than they were this time. So we, we have lots we can do, but we need partnership to do it. And I'm sure Luke will, will finish that off. <laughs> Jakob? Yes, thank you. I'll be very brief because I think the time is already running out and the sun is coming out, at least in Brussels. So I was very glad today to be uh, represent, uh, able to represent the workers in such an interesting panel on, um, on a very important topic. Uh, I was quite happy to see that there was very broad agreement on the need for better funding and more quality jobs. And we're very happy to, to be working together with our colleagues from the Commission from the Coordinated Action Group and also with uh, our social partners from the European Federation of Social Employers to try and push for these changes and, uh, and see whether we can be ambitious, how ambitious we can be with the tools at the disposal of the European Union. Thank you. Thank you, Jakob. Uh, and Luke, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Laura. And uh, I would like to start by, by thanking you and thanking uh, the European Policy Centre for for the active in involvement in uh, not only in moderating, but also in the organization of this, uh, of this I think, very rich, uh, very interesting uh, event, very interesting uh, discussion uh, we had. Uh, and I will not even try to, to repeat or to sum up, but I, of course, would like to, to draw through conclusions, uh, looking at things uh, from, from the perspective of the uh, coordinated uh, action. Um, First of all, and that's, I think, the, the, maybe the most important uh, conclusion, um, social services are essential services. And that is not always understood by, uh, by people uh, responsible at member state level 
and also maybe sometimes at the level of, of the European institutions. Um, social services are essential services and making that clear uh, requires, and it was, uh, I think, very rightly said by President Van Rompuy, um, recognizing that starts by stopping economizing on social services and on uh, reducing the sector to purely a market element. We are not just a market element. We are essential services. And that for me is maybe uh, one of the first and maybe one of the most uh, important uh, conclusions. Secondly, the crisis is uh, far from over. It is not over yet. Uh, and and if, you, if you listen to, to, to the media and, and you follow a bit the European and, and, and other uh, continent media, we might have a, a fourth, a fifth, and a sixth wave coming up. And if it's not this virus, then something else might come, as rightly said by some, uh, some of the speakers. So we should prepare for the future. We should prepare for the future. And that means that we should um, understand what happened during this crisis. Of course, uh, economic growth was, was slowed down. In some countries, it was stopped or even uh, reversed. But this, uh, this crisis had a very deep impact on the lives of people, individuals. Uh, many Europeans lost their job. Many lost a family member. Many lost stability in their lives and, and mental uh, health uh, stability. Uh, many lost indeed uh, their life. And social services, social support systems try to respond um, as, as good as they could with very limited resources. Uh, some even collapsed. A lot of innovation was, uh, was shown and, and resilience was shown by the sector, but we had to go through hell in some parts uh, of Europe. And indeed, as said by some of the speakers, in some countries, the staff those that work in this sector had to work in uh, really unacceptable, unacceptable conditions. And we should not also forget, of course, the important role of family carers and volunteers, because also they had to go through very, very difficult uh, um, situations. We, the European networks, we joined forces. Uh, we try to inform the European institutions. Uh, we try to make clear what, uh, what is really going on at grassroots level. And I think that it maybe was the first time that uh, public services represented by, by ESN, also private not-for-profit not for services, uh, trade unions, social employers, we joined together and we uh, tried to work with the European institutions informing the European institutions and also supporting our members that are active at uh, grassroots level by uh, supporting the development of appropriate financial instruments. We empowered our members to work their way through this very difficult uh, period and we are supporting them now to make sure that the needs and the concerns of our sector also are understood when member states uh, develop recovery plans and uh, set up uh, action plans um, uh, with regard to, to the implementation of uh, the ESF Plus and other programs. We did all that and speaking with one voice paid off. Indeed, it has proven to be very uh, important and we will keep on uh, doing uh, that. All this happened uh, and indeed it is the moment as uh, rightly said by uh, again by president uh, varon by uh, it is the right moment to draw a few important conclusions and for me apart from the fact that we should not reduce our sector to uh, a market element only we should also be clear on the broader agenda of the european institutions the focus on green and digital is great it's important but it should be social as well. In these, uh, in these agendas, the social agenda should be included because it became clear that all structural problems that we have in our sector, underfunding, old, outdated infrastructure quite often, understaffing, poor working conditions, all these structural problems that we had before the crisis became uh, now much clearer. And uh, we, must, we must face it. Face it. 
after 14 months of crisis, there is not really a lot of EU funding going into social. Although the European Commission uh, has developed a few instruments and a few mechanisms, uh, I must say that uh, the reports that we receive are not so convincing. There is not that much EU uh, funding that reached the grassroots level, that reached the grassroots social uh, services uh, yet. And that is, I think, a second important uh, conclusion. If the money is not earmarked, it will not reach our sector. We have to be clear on that. It is good to mainstream, but we mainstream the social sector out. And that is a risk, and we should take that into consideration, I think. The social pillar uh, is very important, and it is, I think, it, it, it is okay. It is a, a very useful instrument, and it can help our sector. And it is indeed, uh, to a large extent, about investment in social services and investment in the workforce uh, of our sector. But then, indeed, the, um, the, the governmental, the government leaders in Porto should, should uh, put uh, the wallet where the mouth is. This agenda, the social, the, the, the social pillar has to be properly resourced. And if we don't do that, it will not reach its uh, objectives. And that is for me, the third uh, conclusion. We have to properly uh, resource the, uh, the social uh, pillar. Dear colleagues, wrapping up, don't reduce the sector to a market element only. And that has an impact on how we organize public procurement and all different types of funding mechanisms and instruments. Uh, money has to be earmarked. That should be clear, I think. The targets of the social pillar, well, resource it properly and please understand that employment is not the only objective of the social pillar. It is enjoyment of social rights. And that means that also those that uh, can't uh, reach the labor market or can't get uh, integrated in the labor market should have uh, decent living conditions and should be able to live a decent life. The focus on green and digital, we embrace it as hard as we can, but it should be social. We should make it a social transition. And that is, I think, crucial. We, social service providers, should also invest in innovation and in the effectiveness of our sector. That is, uh, that is clear. We have to do our own homework uh, ourselves uh, as well. And we have to work on that. We have to invest uh, in it uh, ourselves as well. And we have to speak maybe much more than in the past with one strong voice. For Porto, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating, I think. Uh, Porto is a, it's a very interesting wine. A port wine is sweet and a bit sour as well. And that is what makes it so, so interesting. So let's make sure that uh, the uh, conclusions in Porto are sweet and sour. It should be about real commitment, but also about putting the money uh, where uh, the mouth uh, is. Uh, we should make sure that social is well reflected also in the recovery plans. If it's not there, then what we are saying here is uh, not much more than uh, window dressing. And to the commission, uh, we worked a lot with the Commission over the last 14 months, and I must say, I really uh, am, am very grateful for that. The cooperation was good, was positive, uh, was interesting. We did not always agree, but we always came to, I think, useful conclusions, and we always found uh, the way forward. Um, to the Commission, thank you very much for that. Please make sure that our help desk is launched as soon as possible so that we can further empower uh, our sector. And maybe, maybe we should together uh, look at readjusting a part of the machinery. If some pol policy initiatives and instruments, funding instruments, do not reach the objective, do not reach our sector, then we maybe have to review uh, parts of this uh, machinery and parts of these uh, instruments. I would like to thank everybody that contributed to uh, 
the today's uh, event. Again, uh, European Policy Center, thank you very much for your commitment uh, to this uh, uh, to, to, to this uh, event and the work you have put in. It is very important for us. Of course, I would like to thank um, on behalf of the coordinated action, again, uh, President Herman van Rompuy for his excellent opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Director Sukova, for your uh, contribution and uh, availability. And then all those that took the floor and that contributed to debate, thank you very much. But the work is far from over. The crisis is far from over. And only by working together, we will be able to make a, a real difference in the life of uh, individuals with support needs across the European continent. Thank you very much. And see you soon, I hope, in real life. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. That was a lovely closing speech. I think, yeah, all we can add is indeed all eyes on Porto. Uh, and EPC will be following, uh, following it all and uh, we'll be doing some more events in the wake of the summit as well. So again, thank you very much for joining us and thank you very much for your presentations. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.